Okay. Roll call. Uh, we got one more minute. Okay. Well, it is 12. It's 12.30 now. Shall we go on and start? And then Stuart can catch up. Okay. Okay. Good, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our first Zoom meeting in, in light of the emergency and stay-at-home order for by the governor as well as Cook County and the, and the mayor. We don't care about the mayor. So I'd like to call the meeting to order for the April 21st Wilmette Public Library trustee meeting at 12.30. Trustee Varshis, can you do the roll call, please? Mm -hmm. Thank trustee you. Varshis, present. Trustee Fishman? Present. Present. Trustee Johnson? Here. Trustee Riddle? Present. Trustee Rogers? Here. Trustee Wolf? Not yet. And Trustee McDonald? Here. Thank you. Uh, we had requested that we have some observers uh, observing the meeting, and at this point, we would like for them to introduce themselves. Is that what you wanted, Anthony? Yes, um, that way we can enter into the record who all of our attendees are today. Okay, we have Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca, can you introduce yourself? Okay, no, they can, you're unmuted, Mom. I just say your name. And what, okay, it's Rebecca. She's from Circulation. Hi, everybody. Hi. Okay, Rebecca, what's your last name, please? Rebecca, your last, last name? is Ron and Aquin. Sorry. Okay. okay. Mary? Uh, Mary Lawler from the League of Women Voters, just observing. Welcome. Amy? An interlibrary loan. Okay. And Liz? Yeah, Liz Seeger. League of Women Voters. Great. Thank you, Liz. And Jenny? Okay. Oh, I'm trying to unmute you. And I can't. Oh, hi. I'm just <laughs> visiting, just listening, seeing what's, uh, what's being discussed today. So. Jennifer, who are you representing? Um, I am um, from Adult Services. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anthony may know you, but we don't know. We don't know everybody by name sometimes. Thanks. You can say your name and who you're representing. So, uh, Joan's iPad. Please introduce yourself. Um, Joan, Joan Fletcher, Adult Services. Up Joan's iPad. Oh. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Joan. And um, library patron? Uh, it's Patsy Devono from Shelby. Thank you, Patsy. And GR Justman? Hi, it's Gail Rosenberg Justman from Technical Services and IT. Hi, Gail. Good to see you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Oh, in the Hi. Support. <laughs> Technical Services and Support. Oops. I say hey, hey, it. <laughs> Okay, um, and we have, this keeps moving around on me here. Okay, Stuart is here. Yeah, hi, how are you? All right, so continuing with our patrons or our guests, um, we've got John Risco. Hello. Hi, John. Hi, John. I am the uh, new finance manager and uh, I hope to meet you all someday. Okay, welcome. Yes, someday soon. <laughs> okay, next we have Jessica Thompson. Hi, I'm Jessica Thompson. I'm a cataloging librarian in technical services. Thanks for joining us, Jessica. All right, and we've got Louise's iPad. Louise, can you introduce yourself? Louise Nidar, Finter Library Loan. Hello, everybody. Hi, Louise. Hello, how are you? I'm good. I hope you are too. Then we've got three phone numbers. All right, so the first is um, 7784. Can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, it's Barbara Goodman from Adult Services. Hi, Barbara. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Hey. Thanks, hope you guys, I hope everybody's well. 
Our next guest is um, 4943. Can you introduce yourself? Say 4943. And you are? Shanti DeCosta from Technical Services. All right, thank you for joining us, Shanti. And our last telephone guest is uh, 4590. Can you introduce me? Suzanne Aris. I'm in adult services, uh, just listening. Great. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Mm -hmm. OK. That concludes. Right. Welcome, everybody. And since there are no public comments at this time, since none were sent in, let's attach behind number is the review of the draft minutes from February 18th, behind number two, no, behind number one. Are there any corrections or additions? No. The motion we approve the minutes. I'll second. Has, and who seconds it? Barsha's. Okay, Stuart has moved and moved that we approve the minutes from the February 18th meeting and Jan Barshis has seconded it. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Okay. Moving right along. There is no presentation and so we will proceed to the treasurer's report. Trustee Rogers, would you like to do the financial reports for February and March? Yes, now I have combined the numbers for February and March by this uh, process. Uh, during the two month period, we've received just under 2.6 million in uh, real estate taxes. Um, that's not a surprise. That's uh, because the tax bills were due in early March. Um, we've received about $21,000 in general fund interest and uh, $7,800 in miscellaneous income. Uh, as of the end of March, uh, we are at 69, just below 70% um, of general fund expenses, uh, and the expected nine month rate would be 75%. So we're well within budget. Um, there is nothing extraordinary in the expenses. Um, what I'm going to do next is move approval of the bills and salaries uh, for February and March. Uh, if there's a need for us to separate two months, we can do so. But unless there's a question about any of the items in that report, I'm going to move approval of the two months as a single motion. I, I have a question. I, I don't have any objection to combining them, but I do have a question. Okay. Uh, I, and it's, I guess it's a question for the director. Um, you know, I'm under the impression we're at uh, full payroll during this period. And the question I have is, are, is the plan to continue to stay at full payroll for the foreseeable future? Or is there any plan to adjust our payroll given that the library is closed? Our current operational plan has been to compensate staff for their regularly scheduled hours um, for the balance of the closure. Um, we have our budget in for um, the entire fiscal year, so we've received our revenues as reported. Um, so our plan is to continue compensation for staff for this plan um, for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, given the, the governor's um, position on the closure, um, we're at least going to continue with this process through April 30th. Um, if we need to take any extraordinary uh, measures and consider alternative plans, um, we should take that up as part of uh, a closed session meeting to discuss compensation at our um, rescheduled treasurer or our uh, um, finance committee meeting in the first week of May. Okay, it's been moved but not seconded that we accept the financial. I, I seconded, it, Lisa. Lisa. Okay, you did. I seconded. Okay. Okay. Yes. I had a question though too. I'm sorry. I don't. I don't know if I wasn't heard. Are we still able to ask? Of oh yes. Yeah, generally, after you second it, it's open for discussion. So go on, Trustee Riddle. Thanks. I just wanted to ask if we could please 
make it a, a little bit of a note or narrative or asterisk. It says notes on financial reports for February 2020 and just to be sure that it's noted that it's February and March. Okay. On the front page. Okay, thank you. So uh, two separate documents. Could, which document are we referring to? Because there are two documents. The front February page. attachment is follow include the March. Yes, uh, I see. I see the attachments. Page. Just the very front page, if you would consider adding that well, on, the report, the on the report's front page. If we conduct future meetings in this fashion on a monthly basis, this won't occur again. And I, that's why I think it's extraordinary and just to put a note on the very front page of this report that we combined them both. But they're not combined on the same page. The um, report. We could no. rewrite the report and have the report be for the February March, but you'll see that there's a February report and a March report. They're two separate documents. And that's right. But on the you very front page. page? I think that would be helpful or some type of asterisk I consider if you'd consider something on the very front page. Can we just put it in the minutes that it was combined for Jan uh, February and March and the attachments will be present? If you, all of you agree that that's the best um, rather as opposed to having an asterisk on the very front page, that's, that's fine. They are separate attachments. They just happen to be in our board packet combined. They're two separate documents. That was just uh, a consideration. If it's not, if it's not consider, if it's not considered a, you know, a amenable to everyone, then that was my question of consideration. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I move that we vote, Trustee Barshi. Okay. Is this an up and down? Yes, no. What? Yes, no. Yes, okay. no. Um, Trustee Barshus, no. Trustee Fishman? I'm sorry, we're voting on the approval of the, the, oh, the budget. Uh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, not the budget. <laughs> we're, approving, we're approving the um, uh, checks and, and payments for February and March. Okay, sorry. Trustee Barshus, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson. This is for just March, right? February, February and March combined. February and March. Okay, I'll vote yes. Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. Trustee McDonald? Yes. Okay. Okay. We're moving on next, and trustee to tab number three. Mm -hmm. We're on four. We're on four. We're oh, on we three and four. Yeah, Twin Oaks. Uh, Director uh, Austin sent you out on four sixteen a letter detailing his request for approval for the bluestone section for the completion of our outdoor renovation with the two quotes and would you like to add some additional information um i did get a couple questions um so if, Fina, if you want to if you want to ask your questions this is a, a time that we can do that um as i mentioned in my message um to you last thursday we did see um uh, multiple quotes for this particular project um, what we're what we're discussing here is a small 30 square foot section of turf that is immediately off of um, the, the sidewalk immediately in front of the library by the flagpole um, on Park Avenue. And the section in question. Um, Anthony, was, you're cutting out a little bit. If everyone can put their, them on themselves on mute, then we can hear you more clearly. All right, I'm going to, I'll start over. Is this better? Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Um, the section that's in question here is a 30 square foot section that is along Park Avenue near the flagpole on the main entry plaza of the library. As you know, we did a renovation of um, the, build, the grounds last summer and we replaced the concrete around the flagpole 
And in the process of doing that, we changed the shape of what the entry area looks like. Um, we didn't anticipate this, and um, I discussed this with our architect, um, Jody Mariano at Tesca, um, last fall when we discovered that patrons were using our new design a little bit differently than what we had intended it to be. Um, there's a, a good number of patrons who approach the library from the south and west side, and therefore they um, are taking a, a shorter path to get to the main entrance of the library than um, what we designed uh, on that, that hardscape plaza. Um, and what has happened is um, what I showed you in, in the picture, basically patrons are trampling over the turf in that space and it's created a muddy area and that mud is being tracked onto the new plaza as well as into the library when it's, when it's a wetter condition. Um, we've gotten some complaints from patrons who have gotten muddy shoes as a result of it. Um, and I do think that the difference in grade there um, does present a little bit of a, of a concern in terms of a liability exposure. Someone could very well roll their ankle on that space. Um, we analyzed a number of different solutions to this, and um, we ultimately determined that this area should have been included as part of the hardscape redesign, um, that patrons who are approaching the library from the residential areas to, from the south and west along Park Avenue um, it, it does make it a little bit more of a challenge. If you just kind of, if you walk that space on your own individually, you'll see you kind of have to adjust your gait in order to get into that area uh, when you're walking. Um, so as I said, we did, we did seek multiple quotes for this process, um, even beginning last fall, although the weather last fall made it such that we weren't able to complete the project before uh, the ground froze. Um, Twin Oaks is the company that did our landscaping project and installed the bluestone um, during the renovation project last summer. Um, they've submitted a proposal and that's what's before you here today. As I mentioned in my email to you all, one of the challenges with trying to get uh, contractors to work right now, um, well, there's a number of challenges, obviously. We're in the midst of an unprecedented <laughs> pandemic. Um, and we're also um, finding it hard for people who can uh, conform with our requests and requirement for prevailing wage labor on a project like this. Um, we're also challenged by the time frame that we're dealing with and we'd like to try to complete this project when it is disruptive to the public. In anticipation of trying to reopen some services here in the near future, um, and likely ones that might involve uh, a curbside pickup, which we'll get into here in a moment, um, we want to create a space that is more um, welcoming and creates egress. And so we'd like to get this done as soon as possible. Um, Twin Oaks is the only vendor that we um, were able to receive a quote from that met our specifications for prevailing wage labor. And um, we find that their, that their proposal um, is consistent with what we would expect. Uh, we, we know that their bluestone would match and that it would be done to the same specifications of the work that was done here last year and therefore it would blend in and look like it was part of the intentional plan in the first place. And so that's why we have that before you. Do you have any questions for me? I have a, a couple of questions. One is, uh, will they be able to match the color and the surface, all right, that matches, you know, matches what already is out there? It's a different, obviously a different stone lot because the season is passed. It's not going to be the same palette of stone that was used elsewhere, but it's the same providing vendor and it will be done to the same specifications, including all the subgrade, which is really the piece that was most, I mean, obviously the aesthetic is a concern, um, but having everything done um, compacted underneath it is, is the key element. Um, and we know that their work can, can complete that, okay. that detail. So it, it will match as much as we can make it match. Okay. I think the most important thing here is safety, not just the muddiness, but um, people not looking when they're coming out with a load of library books later when they reopen uh, could very well sprain an ankle or whatever else by stepping off that one part there. So I think it's a good thing to do. And as long as this company, is, th is this someone we've worked with before, Anthony, you said, or not? Yes, they did the renovation project. Okay. Then and they installed the plantings as well as the bluestone. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's all. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? This is Joan. I walked over there the other day and um, it's, I can see that the way the curve is, it is a natural tendency to cut that close. 
I find it a little amusing that people are angry that their shoes are muddy because they're the ones walking on the grass. However, we'll um, make that, I, I approve that change. I think that's a good idea. So is there a motion? And I approve it also because I think you're never going to be able to recede it and stop right. people from going across right. that path. <laughs> and it completes the landscape project, the outdoor renovation project, as we called it. And it can be done during this downtime. Is there a motion? Well, are there any other comments? I have a comment. I had a few okay. comments. I forwarded these to Anthony already, and he answered my some of my questions. But my initial thought was that um, it, it sounds like we did try to, to block off the area um, without success, but um, you know, I was my initial thought was to try to maybe communicate a little bit better with the patrons and and make them feel like this is their own space because one wouldn't really trample on their own space or their own grass and leave a mess if it was their own home. So if we could make them feel like it was their own space, they wouldn't do so. You know, I thought we could consider some type of project here um, and in the alternative of, uh, of the land, of the uh, paving, the blue, the blue stone paver or some type of project um, led by either like a youth group service or the adult group services. I don't know if any of you have been kind of, I've been involved with some of the schools, um, you know, trying to uh, create some type of community while we're out of school and um, painting these rocks have been around our neighborhood a lot. And, um, uh, you know, putting maybe these painted rocks from with messages of hope or a seasonal message in that area with some type of plaque or sign that we would sponsor there that um, we could, you know, we could use as some type of either, you know, either, you know, please use the sidewalk or this is, this could be like a sign or a plaque of a descriptive educational nature. But I had some alternative thoughts of using this space um, so that, you know, patrons would see that this was part of the, their, you know, community, their Wilmette community, public library community, and it, they wouldn't trample, trample on it. Uh, but those are also cost savings. They, they do represent some cost saving ideas, and that's what I wanted to kind of bring forward here. Any other thoughts or discussion? No, but I like the idea of the rocks, Tina. I don't know that it uh, belongs right here, but that might be something to put on the back burner and uh, bring out uh, to put elsewhere around the library as a project like that. Is there a motion? I move the a motion we approve this, Lisa. Okay, so is there a motion that I think that we approve the endorsement of the um, what do you call it S landscape not to exceed seven thousand I guess yes I motion we approve okay Stuart is approved second Ron? Trustee Rogers second okay it's been moved and second to approve the uh, side the bluestone side path not to exceed I'm seven thousand Madam, Madam President was there any response to Trustee Riddle's questions. I think you had a a, a suggestion from Trustee Barshi that it may it's a good idea, but it may not go. Or she can speak to, to herself. That was the only comment at that this point in time. I, I I thought it was directed to the director. I may have missed that. Okay. You know, well, it was directed to all. I I did already forward these to Anthony. Thank you, um, and Anthony did respond. So it was to all of it was to all of us for discussion. Yeah. Do any of you uh, want to comment on what Tina's proposal is? I would suggest that the liability issue alone uh, could cost much more than what is proposed as a solution, and it resolves the problem in a way that doesn't require that we change anyone's behavior. Um, one lawsuit would substantially outdo the cost of putting in bluestone to fix the problem. The, so the other, you know, well, we have a liability issue um, along all property of the library, the sidewalks, 
not just this muddy, muddy area. People could twist an ankle, fall in the parking lot, you know. But what I wanted to say is these are the alternatives that I brought up would, would um, you know, also prevent the muddy mess. It would be in place of. Um, but they require you know, changing the behavior of people who are not likely to do so easily. And so it's much easier for us and it eliminates this particular liability issue to simply fix it. Yeah, and you know, I disagree. I think that, we, I, I don't know, I have some further hope and, and, and confidence in people to take a look at a sign that says, please use the sidewalk. I know a sign maybe, a sign and some, you know, extra landscape could, could hopefully, I have, I think I just have belief in other, other ways we could do that. Paved Sorry. and unpaved areas are pretty obvious. They've ignored that. So I think it's time for us to move on. Let's let's vote on this. Okay. Trustee Barshes? Trustee Barshes? Yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? Yes. Trustee Riddle? No. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Rusty Wolf? Yes. Rusty McDonald? Yes. Okay, so the, the motion is carried. Um, I will reach out to Twin Oaks and we will coordinate to have this installation done and I will keep you posted on what our progress is on that project. Thank you. So Trustee Austin, do you want to continue with the pandemic response and reopening plan? Starting yes. with that? All right, um, and I'm not yet a trustee, so I will be the director today. I'm sorry, director. <laughs> I always call you trustee, but no, you haven't run for election. <laughs> um, okay, so um, behind attachment five in your packet, you will see um, a document. Well, that contains three documents. Um, this is our pandemic response and planning documentation. Um, on the cover sheet, what I've done is I've outlined what the contents of this, um, of this section are. Uh, the first piece includes our pandemic response procedures. Um, this information was compiled um, in early March, and we modified this information right up until the time when we needed to basically implement every aspect of it within several hours. Um, we met with the leadership team on March 12th to discuss the possibility of the library closing for the pandemic. And we very quickly needed to move through um, the two final stages of that plan um, that, that day and then the following day, that Friday the 13th, when we were closed. Um, so I wanted to share that information with you as that draft plan was one of the ob um, objects that was going to be on our agenda for our March meeting, which was then canceled that following week. So. Um, that is there for your information about the steps that we took. That will be incorporated into our disaster planning materials in the future, and we'll continue to adapt that information as necessary um, going forward. The second piece of this document is a summary um, of the continuity of services that the library has provided. Excuse me, Anthony. Yes. I, I would like after each section to ask if, if anyone has any questions. I'm just introducing everything right now, but if you'd like to go that way, that's great. So any questions? Regarding your pandemic response and planning documents, because you're still going over that, right? Then you're going to go over the continuity of service? I was just introducing the, the packet, um, the information, okay. and then we can get into each one individually, but we can stop oh. right now and talk about the, the procedures. What's your pleasure, other board members, in terms of if you've got questions? Okay, go on. Okay. I'll ask my questions later. Okay. The, um, the second piece of this document is the summary of the programming that the team has done since the closure. Um, this was sent to you separately via email when that document was finished. That was um, four weeks, approximately one month after our closure. Um, and this 
This document, I mean, it contains an awful lot of information about how we've been able to scale so many of our services to this remote environment. Um, and I'm happy to take your questions on that here in a moment. The third piece of this document is um, our planning for the future. And in particular, um, what, we're, what we're looking at here, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna just mute this, this one here, sorry. I'm gonna I'll unmute you all again here in a moment. I'm getting a little bit of feedback in the background. Um, the, the third document includes a summary, not necessarily an all-inclusive list, of the steps that staff needs to consider when we are looking to reopen the library. And there are a number of steps that are involved in that process. Uh, there are a number of approaches that the library may take as we go forward with that. The leadership team, uh, the staff of each individual department is looking at this plan as well as considering a number of, of details that relate to their general operations and the services that we provide and they're right now thinking of a number of different approaches that we could take in an effort to try to, to serve the public when we need to serve the public out of our building again. One of the key questions that I've been getting from the public and from staff, and I think has propped up in the media more so lately, um, I did forward an article to you from the Chicago Tribune summarizing the activities of uh, the Lincolnwood, Morton Grove, Niles, Park Ridge libraries. Um, and the information that was contained in there largely applies to us as well. Um, that we're all considering the same things. At some point in the near future, we do want to offer curbside service. Um, there are a number of materials that are currently waiting for members of our community on our hold shelf, and we want to get those materials into people's homes. We also have approximately 30,000 items that are checked out right now to our patrons. And at some point when we reopen our book drops, we're going to start receiving about 30,000 items and we need a place to store them, and we need a place to process them. And as I mentioned in this document, we're going to need to quarantine those items for a period of time as well. I think the biggest obstacle and hurdle that we've had as an organization uh, that primarily responds with physical materials in people's homes is how can we safely distribute these physical materials to people um, in the midst of a pandemic? Uh, there's been conflicting information about how long the virus can survive on inanimate objects, namely paper, plastic, mylar, et cetera. Um, we've been looking at a number of inf uh, informational resources on this. Um, this past Friday, Rails, uh, the Reaching Across Illinois Library System uh, that we're a member of, hosted a conference. And in that conference, um, they supplied some more information to us that, that I've included in this packet. And we can get into that a little bit more here in a moment, but that is largely what is going to inform our activity going forward. We want to make sure that the items that we are circulating to the public are as clean as they can be before they get into people's homes. And when we receive them back, we want to make sure that we have safe handling procedures for all of these resources. Now at the moment, with the library closed, if it's just me and one facilities person in the building on any given day, I've got a pretty good sense about how clean this building is. And as I've reported to you all, we've done a lot of action in the building. When this building starts to open up again and we start letting staff come back in the building, we're gonna lose a little bit of control over just how aware we are of the presence of the virus in our building. And if we reopen the building even a little bit further and start letting the public in, and you can bet that we're gonna need to enforce our procedures even a little bit more carefully about our cleaning um, procedures and so on. So uh, making sure that we have a clear path forward, that's exactly what this document is for, and that's what staff is working on. Um, so without further ado, that's just kind of my, my brief introduction to this all, um, but I know that you're going to have a bunch of questions about it, and that's what this agenda item is for. So um, a lot of you are muted right now. If you want to unmute yourselves when you've got a question or raise your hand, um, I'm happy to address any of your questions and comments. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you and your staff for such uh, thorough, in-depth work in terms of thinking about what needs, to, what's happening and what needs to happen. The two questions I have, and I'm just going to start first with the pandemic response and planning documents. On page, th uh, page three, when you talk about A, and uh, the, the last sentence of section A, you say absences for this purpose. Can you hear me? Okay, absences for this purpose will be excused. Are they paid or unpaid? 
we have, we have been handling this event as though it is an act of God, like it is a snow event. Um, and that was our communications initially. When, when the library closes for an event that is beyond our control, a water main break, the roof blows off, um, the snow is too heavy, et cetera, et cetera. Our procedures in the past historically have been that we would pay staff for their regularly scheduled hours for the duration of whatever that closure is. This okay, is an ordinary circumstance. Sorry. I'm sorry? It's, it, what it says is authorities may request that persons returning from an infected area of the world not return to work for a period of time. That's the one I'm talking about. Not from the pandemic, but it's, that's different than what you are saying right now. So that's why I'm just curious. You know, we, we didn't have um, any instances like this, so we, we don't have a policy in place. But I believe the policy would be you would use earned benefit time or we would negotiate with, with the individual. Okay. That's what I was talking about. I wasn't talking about what you were talking about. And then the other question I've got is work adjustments at the bottom on page two. Do you consider the friends uh, volunteers or uh, is that how you would classify them? Because I, I was just curious in the... Um, how that all works out. The friends are volunteers, yes. Um, okay. which, I'm sorry, Lisa, can you tell me which, what section? 2A, uh, uh, two two, three, uh, moderated services, level two, the very last sentence on number two, adjust volunteer work schedules as affected by service adjustments. Because I know that you've hired a volunteer, you have a volunteer coordinator, and you're looking at and you have high school students that are volunteering. So I was also curious, would friends be considered in that category? Yes, the, the friends are our partner affiliate organization, um, but they are also volunteers. And as a result, we've coordinated with the friends and have been in, um, in correspondence with them about what our plans are regarding um, the operation of Books Down Under, their sorting activities, um, we have suspended donations of physical materials from the friends, just as we have suspended donation or um, collection of our own materials, just simply because we don't have the staffing resources with the shelter in place order to um, to empty the drops and collect those donated materials. And as it stands right now, I mean, I really do feel that we need to we need to walk the talk with the state with the shelter in place order. Um, having the volunteers in the building just is not it's not an appropriate. Um, allocation of that time and space. No, I was just asking for clarification if you're consider, considering friends as that part. So thank you. Ron, you had your hands up. Um, one of the things that, that I do think is an issue that we need to plan for, and you may already have done so, uh, if you have 30,000 materials that are currently out in circulation, uh, the drop boxes aren't going to be sufficient to handle the volume that could occur. Um, are you working on uh, or including additional staffing to address the fact that there may be much more material coming back in the first few days that you start accepting those materials than you have the capacity to handle in the present uh, um, area for that purpose? The plan is currently um, the overwhelming majority of our materials are received on site. So um, we would likely modify the environment that we've got adjacent to the book drops um, in the parking lot. Well, I think, you know, we need to be flexible with so many of these plans. We're going to we're just going to need to be to be responsive, anticipate, anticipate and then improvise when it comes time for, you know, um, for us to adjust. Um, on site where the majority of our materials arrive, we may need to simply just have bins out there or have a staff person, um, you know, going through and emptying the boxes more readily or more frequently. Um, or we would just have someone out there collecting those materials. Mm -hmm. um, the remote drops are, are going to be a different story. We'll probably need to, to, um, to empty those um, a couple times each day. Um, Have the remote drops been checked in during this period? Um, also closed off. They they're locked. Um, they're physically locked, um, so materials cannot be placed inside of them. Um, I do drive by the recreation center every day to and from work, and I will frequently just kind of take a peek and see if there's anything that's been left outside of the drop. Um, but I've not seen anything. 
okay? One thing I do think is important to note is that there are so many unknowns floating around in attempting to prepare for um, a stage reopening uh, that this is going to be a moving uh, target. There's going to be a lot of things that can't necessarily be anticipated. I think the staff has done an extraordinarily good job in, um, in anticipating what can be but we just have to be prepared for the fact that there are going to be some surprises. We, we know that we're going to have to be flexible. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, the key element here is that we want to make sure we understand the full scope and we can anticipate whatever the worst case scenario is um, and then kind of plan around that and make sure that we have, that we have enough resources in place to, to handle whatever plan comes up. The other issue in terms of volunteers is that that's actually not until stage three, when you're essentially opening the building to uh, virtually all services. Um, there's just no way that you're going to have that issue occur until you're admitting a lot of people in the building who are simply not going to be present during the early stages of any reopening. I think a key element of of us kind of getting back to whatever this new normal is. Um, for those employees who are able to do the remote work, I think this is a time when we want to continue to encourage that. Um, a number of our staff have been able to adapt their services and to work remotely. Um, I think we want to try to keep people um, at a safe distance for as long as we possibly can. Um, if this work can, continu can continue to be done remotely, at least the majority of the week, I'd like to continue to operate like that. Um, I, my, my staff really is anxious to get back in the building and get back to business. I mean, this is, this is an industry where people love what they do. And uh, we, want it, we want to get back to doing our regular business. But um, we need to do so with health and safety as, in the forefront of our minds. And we're going to take, it, take every step that we can um, to, to keep operations moving the way that they are currently, but also do so in a safe manner and at a safe distance. And I think that's what I've mentioned, you know, we're talking about volunteers here for a moment. Um, I've been in correspondence with uh, the Friends president, uh, Marianne O'Keefe, and, and we've agreed that the Friends really, um, they do fall into a vulnerable category, um, the majority of our volunteers, and uh, we want to protect them. Um, they're very generous with the resources that they provide to us, but, you know, for what we get from, from the Friends in terms of the sales off of Books Down Under, um, it just isn't worth the risk and exposure to have those individuals in the building helping us at this time. Um, when we can get back to a different kind of operation, I think we'll, we'll certainly welcome them back to their space. But for now, we just want to keep them sequestered. Anthony, um, a quick question about um, possibly when staff can um, enter the building. Have you been able to secure all the um, protective equipment that, you know, masks and gloves and so forth? that we hear there's such a, a dearth of it. That's what, you know, protecting staff is, is of utmost importance, of course. Yes, um, several of our vendors have been reaching out to us individually and they've been able to secure um, materials for us. Um, we do have supplies. Um, we, have, we have masks, we have gloves, we have a lot of cleaning supplies, we have toilet paper. Um, we've got all the all the essentials. The question is, is just you know what what volume of supplies and for what period of time do we need to be stocked um, in order to in order to say that yes we we can operate for you know the foreseeable future. Um, there are a number of resources that are available to us. We've got a number of different vendors that provide building supplies, um, and we're, we're working on that. I think the face coverings and face masks. I mean that is that's an official mandate and and well met. Um, now today, so we've all got our masks here. Um, I think individuals will be will want to have their own for their own personal comfort. Uh, the library will provide them for our staff. Um, it will be essential that the public have their own. I don't think that the library can provide those resources for the public. Um, and we won't be able to provide gloves for the public either. In fact, I don't think that gloves are really advisable for anyone. Um, who isn't handling these materials. Um, so when we're checking in materials, when we're moving things from the book drops to our quarantine space, that's an appropriate time to be using gloves when we're, when we're doing material handling. 
Um, but by and large, the experts are saying that hand washing is still really the most effective method for containing the virus and for not spreading it around more. Um, and that sometimes dirty gloves can be more problematic than anything. Um, but you know, we're, again, we're gonna, we're gonna lean on the expert advice here. We're gonna follow what the CDC and the health experts have to say um, about, those, about those resources, but we will be providing as many of those cleaning supplies as we possibly can. Thank you. Fina, yes, Fina. Thanks. Um, again, I, I, I want to reiterate what Lisa said and what I um, wrote to you. And there's, it's an excellent, it's an excellent um, um, policy, um, and it's very, very fluid. And I really appreciate that. Um, I want to add that the, I don't know at the time that you wrote it, the district did finally decide that schools are, you know, closed for the rest of the school year. Um, so if the date occurs that we go on to phase one before, um, or I would say, you know, before the end of the school year would have been, then, you know, it's important to probably remember that you'll have a lot more children, <laughs> obviously, school, school, um, school age children able to use the, the library during the day. Um, and second of all, I think it'd be good, and I know that this is already planned, is before we go into the next phase, before we go from phase one to phase two, revisit any lessons learned, and um, we can add always, this, it's a living document, I know that, and we can always add to phase two and phase three from what we learn, um, you know, living it. Definitely, yeah, and, and as I said, this is um, this is necessarily a summary document. It is not intended to be an all-inclusive tool. Um, each individual department and individual staff member is going to have their own questions and concerns um, and responsibilities. Um, we're all going to have different pieces of this um, as we move forward. Uh, to just outline the plan for an individual department um, would be far more substantial than what we would deal with here um, in this conversation. There's a lot of detail to work out, uh, but you can you can rest assured that our team, they're experts in the work that they do and, and they will be thinking through every detail. Um, Anthony, one other thing. Um, per the article you sent us from the, um, I believe it's from the Tribune, about the other local libraries, have you been in touch with other directors about um, you know, the next steps? Most definitely. Um, every Monday afternoon, all of the former North Suburban Library System directors get together and talk. Um, I believe we had maybe 50 some directors on our call yesterday. This has been a weekly um, process for the last several weeks. Um, that's just one of the, of the resources that we have available to us. We're all dealing with the same thing, so um, it's, it's been great. Um, they share their individual plans with one another. Um, we. Um, that's one of the beautiful things about this industry is we're not in competition with one another. We want to help each other to succeed. So um, a lot of folks have been able to just put together tools like what I've shared with you here, share them with one another, and then take that out to their teams and then discuss, you know, more locally with their individual libraries how to apply those, uh, those changes. So yes, um, we do a lot of environmental scanning. Yes, we communicate with other directors. Um, I think a lot of us directors are relying on one another right now. Um, it's, I don't know what I would do without my peer group. Um, it's, it's good to have people that you can commiserate with to understand what, what problems you're grappling with. So yeah, we, we're leaning on each other pretty heavily right now. Do you yeah, all have, Lisa. yeah, Lisa. I was just saying, any other questions or comments? Okay. Do you want to proceed with just a brief review of he's in, we um, Anthony included basically the next two chapters that trustees are required to read and to think about uh, standards for Illinois Public Libraries access and chapter five building infrastructure and maintenance. And one of the things I think we asked is just in looking at that checklist, does anybody have any questions? Because we're pretty much ready, except for the pandemic. Things have sort of gone asunder, but in terms of some of the requirements, I think we're pretty much, we would get stars on most. Are there any deficits that you saw that we need to work on, Anthony, once this thing blows over? 
you know, there, there are a number of things that we can improve upon, you know, and that's, I mean, for, you know, this is one of the things that we talked about at the outset of our requirements for going through every chapter of this book has been, um, we meet, we're, we're going to meet every one of those um, standards just because of the, the type of organization that we are. Um, we've been in compliance for a long time. Now, I think the key element there is how can we build upon our successes and, you know, exceed those requirements, um, you know, appropriately. And um, so one of the things that, that I've been looking at is going through these checklists and seeing, you know, are there any areas that we might be able to improve? So, you know, under access, one of the key elements there is something that's been on our minds for a long time, and that is the library has the minimum required number of parking spaces. All right, we know parking is a challenge, so that's certainly one thing that we want to continue to look at. Um, the library's lighting levels comply with lighting standards. Well, our library lighting levels do comply. Um, however, we did identify recently that some of the light fixtures in, in some of our spaces, the first generation of LED lighting that we installed, um, we we could have we could have done a little better there, and so we're we're in the process right now of installing new LED light bulbs into the existing fixtures that we have in an effort to enhance the foot candles so that the lighting is better and people can see the, the resources in, uh, particularly in the um, uh, recent arrivals, uh, popular materials area, as well as in the media room. Those are two areas that have historically been kind of darker, and we're trying to improve lighting. So just a couple examples, those are some areas that we're looking uh, to try to do some improvements. Um, did you all see anything else that kind of piqued your interest or things that you would like me to focus on as we look at these chapters? I just had a question. Do we have aerial streets? Uh, the library has an identifying sign. I know we have one clearly visible from the street, but are additional sign guides used from aerial streets to the library? That was the only one I didn't know because I haven't been riding around or looked at it, but that was one of the questions I had. From the arterial streets. Um, right. Yeah, that, that is certainly something that we could look at a little bit more. Um, there isn't a sign on Lake Avenue, for example, directing uh, library traffic down Park Avenue, for example. So that could be something near Botman Park that we could put a sign there that would direct people uh, to head south. Um, when you're approaching on Green Bay, I don't know that there's a sign as you're approaching Wilmette Avenue from either direction um, that would tell you where to go. So that would be another thing that we could analyze. Okay. Others, any questions or thoughts? Okay. And number five, you're sort of working on with the project that we're currently doing. I think should facilitate that. Yes, definitely. Okay, and you, do you have a brief update of the timing? Because I know things are really up in the air. As to yeah, so, so Lisa, are you, you're referring to the Capital Reserve Study plan? Right, because a lot of that stuff in Chapter 5 references, that will solve a lot of, answer a lot of those questions. It will indeed. Um, and I think kind of being on a regular plan for this um, to do these types of studies, um, you know, every five years or so, I think is a good idea to make sure that we're hitting our benchmarks. Um, so um, the Ingrid Anderson Capital Reserve Study is nearing its completion. Um, we have just gotten word. I'm sorry, there's a little bit of chatter here. I'm going to mute you for a second, Lisa. Okay. Um, the, um, we have just gotten word from Ingrid Anderson that they're getting close to, to being finished with their project. Um, we hope to have a summary here for executive review in uh, late May. Um, I, in a perfect world, I would love to have Joe out to do an overview of the plan for you at the June meeting then. Um, and that can help to inform our planning as we move forward because that's Typically around that time is when we would be looking at our special reserve fund expenditures um, and plan for the coming fiscal year. Um, and it would be nice if we could incorporate some of that um, in, into our um, budget planning documents for the near future as well as for the long range. Um, so I think we're on target with that and I'll give you an update as soon as I've got more information. Um, as far as you know, the background work that we've done, um, I'm really excited about a little piece of this project that relates to all of the building plans. Um, we have just sent out all of the blueprints and drawings for the library that we've, we've had in, uh, here for, for years um, to be digitized. 
Um, and the cool thing about that is that all the as-built drawings, all of the elevations, um, basically the, the entire history of the, the trending that this building has gone through with its renovations is now being archived digitally. And anyone who works on the building going forward will be able to digitally review all of that information. To date, we've only ever had paper files and they've not really been organized. They're just kind of all in rolls of blueprint and have been stored in plastic garbage bins for years. Um, so um, I'm thrilled to say that we've gotten those all digitized and they have metadata attached to them um, and everything. And there's a separate website that's being created for these that we'll, we'll be able to uh, share with our contracted vendors going forward. That will help them to have a better picture of what the library looks like and how we can um, uh, do our future renovation projects. So I'm excited about that. Um, but yeah, as it stands, I think I'm kind of, I'm in a holding pattern right now. I think, you know, until I've got a little bit more information from our contractor, that's about the best I can tell you, but we're on target. I'm sorry, Lisa, I had you muted. Oh, that's okay. Thank you. I know. Thank you. Any other questions regarding those two chapters? Okay. Do you want to move on to the scheduling the finance committee? Trustee Rogers and so this is typically the time of the year when we would be um, preparing for our budget. And as a result, and given the timing of the, the way the world is today, things are a little bit unique. Um, so I think we need to have a, a more intentional conversation about what our, our financial planning process is going to be this spring. So it's time to get a meeting on the schedule. Um, Ron, do you want to take us through this? Well, I think that, I mean, we could, we could deal with the selection of dates um, online. That's not something we need to resolve here today. Uh, the basic issue, though, is that um, our budget planning process can occur within our uh, deadlines, but it's not going to match exactly what our schedule in past years has been when we didn't have the current situation. Um, so, you know, we have to approve the levy uh, by November. Uh, we normally approve the appropriations ordinance um, in August or September. Um, we generally have a, a budget ready to publish uh, in June or July. Those dates may have some flex or need to have some flexibility in them under the current circumstances. Uh, we also have a new uh, uh, budget or business manager uh, and it's going to take some time for some of the things that are unique to us uh, to get uh, worked out. So I think you know, the bottom line is we need a finance committee meeting to discuss uh, how the process is going to, to be handled this year. Um, but the one thing everyone should be aware of is that it's not going to be identical to how we've done it in the past year. Um, I think the dates we can work out online. There's no reason why we need to take this time uh, to address that issue right now. And I just have uh, one comment. Uh, Trustee Johnson uh, resigned from the committee, the Finance Committee, and in his place, Trustee Fishman will now be on the Finance Committee. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Director. All right, so we'll, um, we'll send out an email uh, doodle poll um, for scheduling up this meeting. I'd like for us to target the week of May 4th. That's the first week of May. Um, so hopefully um, we can arrange some time within our schedules to meet that week. And then we will notice that up the way that we've done this meeting. Um, Athena had a really great suggestion that we should add our board meeting to our events list in Communico so that that shows up as one of our scheduled meeting activities. And as that's a digital format, it would be a way that we can also do publicity about our Zoom meetings there too and, and have direct links. So I, I like that. So um, we can do that going forward as well to give more visibility to our meetings. All right, so um, on to the director's report. Um, we are nearing our time and we're supposed to be conducting essential business here. I can talk about this report for hours, um, because hours and hours and weeks of work have gone into this. In fact, this report covers 
um, just over two months worth of, of activity, and that's why you've got over 20 pages worth of content here. Um, I think I want to change it around a little bit this month and ask you, do you have any questions or comments about what you've seen in this report? Um, and is there anything that you'd like a little bit more clarity on? Anthony, I would just so say that do you oh, have, I think if, uh, if, if oh, our... Go ahead. And Dan, you want to go ahead? Oh, if somebody else wants to, that's fine. Dan, go, go ahead. ahead and then Stuart will follow. Okay, go ahead, go ahead, Dan. Okay, thank you. Um, forgive me if it's in the report, but did you uh, discuss if the stay-at-home order stays in effect for a long time and the library doesn't open, do you discuss any uh, ways we can reduce our budget and thus our future levy commensurate with the services that we're able to provide? And if not, is that something you can do in a future report? Um, this will certainly be a topic of conversation for our finance committee. You know, so we will, we will apply, um, what the staff's activity has been as summarized in the um, response plan document um, behind uh, tab, uh, tab five, as well as the contents that you're seeing in the director's report. Um, that comprises what the staff's activity has been um, and any future budgetary considerations related to that we can discuss in finance committee. Stuart? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say, uh, Anthony, I think you did a, a very comprehensive job here in the report. So first of all, I wanted to thank you for that because it gave me, at least for me, a very clear sense of everything that's, even despite the library building closing down, um, everything that's extensively going on in different departments. Um, I've also, um, on my own, and then and through some, some things you've written, um, have explored what the different um, library staff members have been offering up um, as resources. Um, I think the book discussion groups are going well. Um, some of the, I saw the team gaming thing that Krista's doing is terrific. Um, so I think, I just wanted to say that I think that, that even though the library staff is under this duress of, of not having the building as a source for, for uh, as a resource, um, we've done a great job. You have led this and the staff has done a great job of, of creating all kinds of initiatives to bring the library out to the community. And um, so I just, I just think we've done a really good job of that. And I think everybody deserves, the library deserves a great, a great job. Uh, um, um, a comment, uh, you know, a, a recognition of that. And I think that um, some of the things we have discussed and we'll discuss going forward um, in the finance committee meeting and other places is how we can continue um, while we're under this current restriction to continue to make the library offering as robust as possible to the greater community, even though it may initially, as it is now in a virtual way um, and slowly as we've talked about opening up to, uh, to physical, some kind of physical accessibility. And I think through that, um, we will find lots of ways to, to, uh, to uh, justify um, why the staff uh, is obviously proven to be so valuable and why to keep them, to keep them on going forward for, for the long haul. Great, thank you for your support. Ron. Um, I think it's also important to note that although the nature of how services are going to be delivered may change, um, there is no reason to assume that we're going to need um, different staffing simply because how we're delivering services is different. Um, a lot of the staff uh, stepping up to do things that they hadn't previously been involved in. Also, the village is actually pushing employers uh, and small businesses in the opposite direction. They are asking employers in Wilmette to do everything they can to keep people on staff. And the, um, uh, the conditions of um, the agencies that you would be pushing staff to um, in coping with the situation do not speak well to wanting to, to, to invoke any of those kinds of of procedures unless we absolutely had to do so. Um, we'll discuss this in, in the finance committee, uh, but the bottom line is that um, all of the uh, direction, all of the um, encouragement is for employers in Wilmette 
to retain staff um, and to try to, to minimize the negative impact on their staffs uh, as a result of, uh, of the current uh, uh, health emergency. So I think that's important for us to keep in mind as well. There is nothing that we should be doing in the short term to change that. Um, obviously, there will be changes in assignments, there will be changes in opportunities as we go through a phased reopening, and that's in the hands of the director, um, and that's already being discussed. So I think that, that you know, as a, you know, our role as a board is to make sure that, that we uh, maintain the resources and continue to allow for uh, as smooth operations as possible under circumstances that no one could have anticipated. Thank you for that, Rob. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? Pina. I, do. I, I really enjoyed the director's report this um, this for the past. I know it covers a, a long period of time while you've been while we've been in shelter in place, and I really enjoyed it. It was like um, you know, just kind of peering into like a window of what you all do. And it was really, really um, just, I admire all of you. Um, Anthony, I think you're an excellent leader during this time. It seems like the staff is super inspired and, um, and really talented. And um, Stuart's right, you all deserve recognition. So it's a really, it was a really nice, um, it was a really nice read. Thank you, Fina. We've got an awesome team. And one more thing, I, I've told so many people, well, if you checked, I think you're really reaching out and doing a, a terrific job, whether it's Facebook or individual librarians postings or the weekly email. Um, I've told a lot of friends about that, that um, who have been bemoaning the fact that the library is not um, open. And in fact, a friend of mine who was always, she just texted me, she said, I finally have broken down and bought myself a Kindle. Now what do I do? So I'm, I'm really positive about turning people on to say, you know, ebooks are the way to go because it's just what they have to do and not, um, you know, put their uh, brakes on to say, I'm, I can't read because I can't get to the library. So one person at a time, turning them on to Libby or Canopy or, or anything else. Um, I think we all are delighted what the library, what the librarians have done. So kudos to them. Thank you. Well, thank you, Joan. Um, our team really, I mean, if you've got some folks that are, that are new to iPads and would like some advice on, on how to use it, how to get the apps on there, how to download and take advantage of all these really incredible digital resources, um, do schedule a time to talk with one of our librarians. We have book a librarian appointments available. Um, you can also live chat with our librarians between 10 and 6, Monday through Friday, um, or email us and schedule a time, and um, we're more than happy to reach out to you and, and help to promote those resources. Thank you. Yep. Anyone else with questions or comments about the director's report or the staff's activities? Oh, I see Jan's talking. I'm going to unmute you, Jan. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I want to second what everybody said. I think that our library, and have always thought our library is really special, and it's due to all the people who work there and make it that way for the individuals in Wilmette and elsewhere who come to our library. So they are expecting that, I think, to continue as much as possible, and I think they're doing as much as possible to make that happen. So I'm very proud to be on the board of such a library, and I thank you and all who have contributed to this. Thank you, Jim. And we're proud to have you as our trustees. Thank you so much for all your support. Are there any other questions or comments on our activities? OK. So the next item on our agenda is to discuss, um, um, I guess, updates from our systems. Jan, did you have anything that you wanted to add from uh, ILA? Uh, not at this time. There isn't much coming down the pipe other than, you know, 
to stay safe and everybody do what they can to make library services available to their residents. So nothing really big. All right, um, on the agenda, you'll see there is a link to ILA's coronavirus information page. Mm -hmm. um, and if you are interested in receiving updates from ILA, um, President-elect Molly Beestrom is sending out messages about every other day. Um, and um, you can see that, that she's got an awful lot of information that she's compiled and is sharing there via email. Um, and they update their content fairly regularly on their page. Um, and so they're certainly one of our guiding groups uh, that gives us a lot of background and feedback and we, and we turn to them. So I would encourage you to take a look at that page. Um, and for Rails, um, I would say the same. And one of the really cool things about what Rails is doing right now is that they're also hosting a lot of meetings. And um, a number of our staff are able to participate in those meetings. They're either through our library training calendar about specific programs um, or specific events that are of interest to us all. Um, so they're doing that. Um, as well as um, things that are more focused towards um, leadership and trying to lead us through this crisis and more background information like what I, I mentioned earlier regarding quarantine and so on. Um, so Rails has quite a lot of uh, information that they're compiling for our system and that information is posted on the, on the agenda as well on that agenda link. Um, all right, so I think that's probably all I had to say about all of that. Do, does anyone else have anything else about Rails or ILA or systems or committees? Uh, did you get any more communications? Um, the only other communications that I um, is basically what's in your packet. Um, Suggestions? Um, uh, not that I didn't receive any patron comments okay. before this meeting. Um, I think you know, the perennial question that a number of us are getting is one that we, we just simply can't answer right now. And that question is, um, when can we come back into the library? When can we check out physical materials again? When are you going to offer curbside like the restaurants? Um, and this question is it's hard to answer, honestly. Um, and I think that this bit of information about quarantine is certainly going to be helpful for us, um, but it doesn't answer all the questions. I think it, it actually opens up even more questions for us to consider. Um, so the key, the key element that I think I can state with certainty over and over again is that we're going to be leaning on um, our, uh, our state and local leaders um, regarding what their determination is of essential and for what types of orders we need to be following at this time. Um, collectively, as, library, um, as, li at li as libraries and library leaders, we're gonna be looking to our systems uh, to give us more guidance about this, and we'll be partnering with our peer and neighboring libraries um, to have a seamless and consistent plan across all of our organizations so that our communities, particularly within the CCS um, system, uh, that patrons can have the same sort of experience at every library. So um, our loan rules will hopefully all be simplified and easy to understand. Um, I think we all collectively agree that we don't want to charge anyone anything punitive, so there will be no fines during this period. Um, we don't want anything to become overdue, and we want to make things as easy as possible for people. Um, so when the time does come for us to offer curbside service, there are going to be a lot of logistical things that we're going to have to work through, um, and we will certainly do that. I just want everyone to know we will offer curbside service. It's just a matter of when it is safe to do so and when our procedures are in place and we can, and we can launch that. But as it stands right now, every item that's on the hold shelf, we will hold for the public. We will make available to everyone as soon as we reopen and we'll give folks adequate time to collect those materials. I'd like to say thank you for your communication. You've been yeah. almost 24 seven and if there, you've got two announcements on there that you all can read. And is there any new business? Is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? I did, Lisa. I had um, just okay. a new business item. And Anthony mentioned it earlier. I, I said that if we are considering holding our meetings public, that um, we consider putting our um, dates and times and Zoom on the upcoming calendar of the Wilmette Public uh, Library website. We can also put them on the Village website. Um, they have a calendar on the right side of the page. Um, and, that, and Anthony mentioned he's going to reach out to the folks, the contacts that he has there. But I think that would give us a lot of visibility. I noticed even just for this meeting, we have so many more participants, and it's really great to see that people are, are interested in in hearing what we're doing. Okay, thank you. Any other comments?
for new business? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. I motion we adjourn. At 1.44, is there a second? Stuart moved. Well, second. second. Who seconded? Tina or, okay. I think both. Okay, <laughs> Tina and Ron. Okay. Thank you and be safe. Yes, Thanks, everyone. you as well. Thank all right, you. thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.